Schofield is 539. Ezra, Ezra chapter 10. Ezra chapter number 10. I won't be long tonight, but we're going to talk a little bit about revival. I've titled the message, There is Hope. There is Hope. Ezra chapter number 10. Ezra chapter number 10, the Bible says in verse number 1, Now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. Now in Ezra chapter number 10, verse number 1, there's a practical application right here, I believe, in verse number one. It's sometimes our tears over others' sins causes others to shed tears as well. Did you get that in verse number one? Ezra got serious with God. He was brokenhearted. He began to cry there before the house of, the house of God, and, and, and look who joined with him. The Bible said in verse number one, a very great congregation. I think revival can start with one person, don't you? Amen. I really believe that. A revival, of course, is a fire, and it burns in the hearts. It burns out the dross. It purifies the life. It ignites the cold heart. It makes the Christians be what God wants them to be. Now, Ezra presents the problems that he faced with post-captive Israel. And really, they're not unlike the problems of today. Though the people of God had been blessed, they still turned away from his side. And it seems like as we look over America and some things that we've been hearing uh, from this pulpit and other places, it seems like America's in bad shape, doesn't it? All you have to do is turn on the news and find out. America's in bad shape, but I believe there's hope. Yes, sir. I, 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 really, believe, I really believe there's hope. If you look at chapter number 9, of Ezra, the Bible said in verse number one, Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. You know what happens? It brings in ideas that are contrary to the Word of God. If we don't separate ourselves, come out from among them. Be ye, I'm talking to the child of God tonight. Come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Let me tell you something. Uh, you people that think you're going to go in a bad crowd and change them, you're going to be fooled. They're going to change you. So we keep ourselves unspotted from the world. And that's exactly what Ezra was facing again with post-captive Israel. Now, if you'll notice in verse number four, well, actually verse number three, when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair off my head and off my beard and of my beard and sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel. Trembled at the words of the God of Israel. Now, I wonder when the last time people got... People actually trembled when the Word of God was preached. As their life was turned inside out, as you evaluate your life in the light of the Word of God, I wonder how many people's going to tremble. If you'll notice in verse number 9 of Ezra chapter number 10, then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together into Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month on the twelfth day of the month, and all the people sat in the street of the house of God. What were they doing? Trembling because of this matter. I wonder when the last time because of sin, maybe in your own life, in your family's life, or sin in the camp, that you actually sit and tremble at the consequences as we read in the Word of God. Well, the Bible said in verse number 6 of Ezra chapter number 9, it said, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head. And our trespasses has grown up into the heavens. Now, if you'll notice, it says in verse number 9, For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving. I think that's what we need today. 
We need a revival, and it needs to begin in the house of God. Amen? Amen. To set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, verse number 10 of chapter 9, Now, O our God, what shall we say after this? Now, you know what he means there. He was not trying to hide his sins. Again, he says, And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy command. We're guilty. There's no sense trying to hide what you already know. And then if you'll notice in verse number 13, And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou art, that thou, our God, hath punished us less than our iniquities deserve. I wonder how many testimonies we could get tonight. And that being the truth, that being the truth in your case, in our case. God has punished us less than we deserve. What is that? mercy. That's just pure mercy. And has given us such deliverance as this. And then if you'll notice in verse number 15 of chapter 9, O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped. As it is this day, behold, we are before thee in our trespasses, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. Now again, as we look at chapter number 9, you can read the whole chapter, the problems that the preacher was facing. Ezra was, Ezra was a man of God. Ezra presents the problems that he faced with Israel. And again, they're not unlike the problems that we face today. But these problems that were brought to Ezra it brought him to the place of fervent prayer, as we read in verse number 15 of chapter number 9. You see, when we hear bad news, what do we do? We glow, do we laugh, or does it bring us to the place of prayer? God, I really need you today. I need you today in this day and age. With everything going on in this land, in my family, in my own life, I sure need you today. Now, we've got to learn something here this evening. Revivals are not accidents. They do not appear without a reason. Revival comes when God's people do certain things. They hear the Word of God, and then they begin to apply the Word of God. If you'll notice what Ezra did in verse number 1 of chapter number 10, when he heard the news, the Bible said that he prayed, and he confessed, he cried, and he humbled himself. It sounds just like what Nehemiah did in Nehemiah chapter number 1 and verse number 4. He prayed and confessed and cried and humbled himself, and he called the people to do the same thing. And then in verse number 2, God lets us know that there's hope for the individual who will turn to him. If you'll notice in verse number 2 of chapter 10, and Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, I guess is the way you pronounce it. <laughs> One of the sons of Elam answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Now underline this in your Bible. Yet what? Now there is hope in Milton, I mean Israel, concerning this thing. You see, there, there, there's hope. Uh, Ezra, of course, it brought Ezra to prayer. He called people to do the same thing. Now, if you'll notice in chapter number 10, and um, verse number 1 and 2, we do what we know to do. That is, confess and repent, according to verse number 1, 2, 3, and 4, actually. And then, according to verse number 5 through 11, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but what we do is we assume the duty and responsibility. Now, God has told us to put some things in order. All through the Word of God, He told us to put some things in order. In other words, if you really want revival, it doesn't come by accident. Take your Bibles, if you will, and go over to 1 Kings chapter number 18. 1 Kings chapter number 18. He was talking about putting some things in order putting some things in order. Once we know what the problem is, we pray, we confess, humble ourselves. Ezra cried, which caused other people to cry, and then they begin to put some things in order. They begin to accept responsibility 
and their duty. Now, if you'll notice in 1 Kings chapter number 18, and I've been here several times before preaching, but this is where Elijah had a contest with the prophets of Baal. In other words, Elijah said, God is God. And because God is God, he's going to do some things. Now, you cry unto your little G, God, and see if he does anything. And, of course, they cried, and Baal didn't do anything. But the true God did something. If you'll notice, the Bible says in verse number 30, and I'm talking about putting things in order. Once you know, then we assume the responsibility and duty. We put things in order in our lives. Now, if you'll notice in verse number 30, Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down, the latter part of verse number 30. If you'll notice in verse number 31, the second thing he did was he took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. The third thing he did, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, according to verse number 32, and he made a trench as the fourth thing that he did about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. The fifth thing that he did is he put the wood in order. He just put some order. And then in the verse number 33 as well, the sixth thing he did, he, was, he filled four barrels with water. He did it the second time. He did it the third time. And then what did he do? According to verse number 36, he began to pray. He accepted responsibility and duty and did what he could. Now, I'm not just saying pull out of the air what you think is right. We get in the Word of God, we find instructions in the Word of God, we begin to apply those instructions in our own lives, putting some things in order. You know how we have church services? We, we got a little order. We start off with the uh, prayer, we song, prayer. We have some announcements. We take up an offering, we have some more songs. Might have a testimony or two, some prayer requests. And then we open the Word of God. Well, all we did is put some order to the service and ask God to bless it. That's what we know to do. Well, God's people need revival. Now, there's hope. There's hope. According to Ezra chapter number 10 and verse number 2, there is hope. It's kind of like um, the disease that's discovered. Once it's discovered, it's half cured. Now, let's apply the remedy quickly before it spreads. I want to read to you in 2 Chronicles, and you know the verse. You know where I'm going now? Revival verse. 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. And verse number 14. Here's the order. If my people, which are called by my name. Now here you're accepting responsibility and duty shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You see, we need revival. We need revival. It needs to start with us individually. It can spread through our church. You remember the first week that I was down here? The first week that I was down here, there was a handful of people and we preached a sermon, and I said, how many will come and pray for the Faith Baptist Church tonight? And I don't, I don't think that there was an empty seat. Brother Danny, you even commented on it, I think. Everybody came down and said, God, please bless the Faith Baptist Church and send revival. I think that a lot of you made commitments that day to put some things in order. And if I put some things in order, I'm asking God to bless and to heal our land. I think if we put some things in order here at the Faith Baptist Church, as a child of God, I believe that every seat here would be filled up. Yes, sir. I really believe that. Why? Because I still believe there's hope. Yes, sir. And I believe there's people out here outside these walls that need what we have in here. Yes, sir. Amen? So God's people need revival. You need revival. Revivals are needed, number one, because of weakness and sin. I've had people come and tell me, I don't need revival. I scheduled a revival meeting, and I'm not going to call his name, not here, at another church I pastored. And he came after the service, and he said, I won't be here for revival. 
And I said, well, why in the world won't you be here for revival? I said, everyone should be here in the revival meetings. He said, well, pastor, I'll just tell you. He said, my life's in order and I don't need revival. Well, you say you came to it looks like you came to the same conclusion I did that he needed revival more than a lot of people. Yes, sir. Amen. If you don't think you need revival, you're the one that needs revival. Yeah. Amen. Usually the people that talk like that are the ones that gives in to the weakness of the flesh. Satan, did you know that the, the the devil, Satan, he hates God. He hates God's children. And you know what else he hates? He hates true revival. Every time in the Word of God, if we go, and again, I use Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter number 1, Nehemiah wept, fasted, mourned, and prayed before the God of heaven and said, God, do you remember what you said you would do if we turned to you? And God kept his promise. Nehemiah put some things in order, and there was a wall built. They got in the building. We're in the building business, amen? And then we get to Ezra, and Ezra was so perplexed about his people he began to weep, mourn, fast, and pray before the God of heaven and begin to put some things in order, and God sent revival to Ezra. Did you know I believe that God can send revival today if you really want revival? Amen. Satan hates God. He hates God's children, and he hates true revival. Why? Because true revival will awaken sleeping Christians to fervently pray and to witness to get the gospel out to a lost and dying world. Let me read something to you out of Romans if you want to turn over to Romans chapter number 13. Romans chapter number 13. Revival, true revival, will awaken sleeping Christians to fervently pray and witness and be what they ought to be for Christ. If you'll notice in Romans chapter number 13, verse number 11, and that knowing the time that now... It is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. And we understand we're talking about the redemption of the body right here. Our salvation is nearer. When is Jesus coming back? I don't know, but I know this. He's coming back. And it's high time that we awake out of sleep is what the Bible said. The Bible goes on in verse number 12 to say, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in riding and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to, the, to fulfill the lust thereof. Now, revival is for Christians. We need revival. Christians need revival. Why? Because many Christians are defeated Christians. They're everywhere. We have them right here at the Faith Baptist Church. I see them everywhere I go. They call me on the phone. I see them at the supermarkets. I see them driving their automobiles. I see them walking about every day in life. They're defeated by sin, big sins, little sins, sins of the flesh, sins of the mind. Sin will hinder you from being what God wants you to be. When you see yourself as God sees you, my dear friend, we begin to confess and pray and mourn. We begin to weep. We begin to set some things in order. And you know what happens to you? Revival comes. Now you're telling people about Christ rather than getting involved in the pleasures of the world. Now, revival is for Christians, number one, because many are defeated Christians. Number two, many are worldly Christians. Just like Demas in 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 10, when the Bible says... Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed into Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. We need revival. Why? Because a lot of people are worldly. A lot of Christians are worldly. We have them here. We have them everywhere we go. Worldly Christians. John says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The world system is, is flashy, and it's appealing. My dear friend, today we need to think who or what can I do to help for the cause of Christ rather than put our minds on the world. Amen. Jesus said over in John chapter number 9, verse number 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh where no man can work. 
Now, number one, Christians need revival because many are defeated Christians. Number two, Christians need revival because many are worldly Christians. Number three, Christians need revival because many are unwilling Christians. Did you know that God has a will for every one of your lives? Every one of your lives. It's evident in Romans chapter number 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13 and 14. God has a will for every one of your lives. Now, yet many sidestep the will of God. God speaks to you, but maybe you've turned away. Jesus said in John chapter number 4 that his meat was to do the will of him that sent him and to finish his work. He had an attitude of confidence and commitment. And that's what we need in Christians today is the same attitude the Lord Jesus Christ had is commitment. Not serve him when you feel like it, but because it's your duty to serve him as a child of God. To put some things in order. What are you here for? We're here, according to Ephesians chapter number 1, to be to the praise of his glory. God has never done anything in your life to deserve second best. He should be first in our lives. We should fulfill his will. In the book of Hebrews, Jesus, uh, the Bible writes, Lo, it is written in the volume of this book concerning Christ, I come to do thy will, O God. Please listen to him today. Listen to the Holy Spirit of God today. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter number 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, talking to Christians, by the mercies of God. What mercies? Read chapter number 1 of Romans all the way through chapter 11 and count the mercies. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, the Bible says, which is your reasonable service. God has never asked you to do anything unreasonable. And everything he has asked you to do, he has given you the provision and the means to carry it out. Amen. Amen. So we need to be in the will of God. Listen to him today and submit to God. Number one, Christians need revival because many are defeated Christians. Number two, many are worldly Christians. Number three, many are unwilling Christians. Number four, many are indifferent. Indifferent. Christians. Take your Bibles, if you will, go to Revelation chapter 3. Did you know that serving the Lord Jesus Christ, being to the praise of his glory, letting your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven is the greatest calling that any man or woman could have. And it's our responsibility. It's our duty as a child of God. We're debtors, not to God. We could never repay God. But didn't Paul say he was a debtor to whom? Debtor to the Greeks and the barbarians. We're a debtor to people. We're a debtor to people. I could never repay Christ. I could never repay God for what he has done for me. But I can sure make him known to other people. I'm a debtor to people outside these four walls. I'm a debtor to people inside these walls. And to people outside as well. Well, people are indifferent. Revelation chapter 3. If you'll notice in verse number 15 and 16, Jesus told the church at Laodicea, he said, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would, thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I heard a sermon preached on that one time. You know what he titled the message? What are you doing in God's mouth anyway? You know what it is? It's indifference. Indifference. There's a lot of indifferent Christians. Look at verse number 19 of Revelation 3. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Christians, tonight I'm asking you to get honest with yourself. We need revival. Now, we can, we can look in the mirror all we want and say our life is in order, but maybe God's revealed some discrepancies in your life. We need revival. 
We need revival. We need to be willing to go out into the Lord's harvest fields proclaiming the wonderful news of God's salvation. If you do not proclaim it, who do you think is? The wonderful news of God's salvation. God became a man. He lived a sinless life. He proved to be the lamb without blemish. He went to Calvary and there he became our propitiation, our sacrifice to please a holy God. God offered himself to appease his own wrath. And God judged Christ after all of our sin was put on Christ. God judged Christ for our sin till he was satisfied. Jesus was taken down off of the cross and put in a tomb. And he stayed there three days and three nights. And the Bible said he was raised for our justification. And the Bible goes on to tell us that he's, he's at the right hand of the Father now making intercession for us. We need to proclaim that message. And because of our heavenly high priest and the, empowered, the, the power that he gives us by the indwelling Holy Spirit, we can fulfill our duty and responsibility as a child of God. Did you know Paul said when he was leaving Ephesus and uh, over in Acts chapter number 20 and verse number 21, he said this. He said, therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every day, everyone night and day with tears. So I'm asking you tonight, if you will uh, if you'll let God speak to you this evening and remember what Ezra chapter number 10 and verse number two, the latter part of that verse says, it says, yet now there is hope in Milton, I mean Israel, in Milton concerning this thing. There's hope. When we just put some things in order as a child of God, leaning on him, I'm going to ask you, if you will, with Stand to your feet, and if you feel like coming to this altar tonight, praying for revival in your own life, praying for revival for Milton, for the Faith Baptist Church, then I'm going to ask you to step out of your seat and come. And you mean it. You make your way down to this altar and just ask God for revival. Would you do that? Send a revival. Let it begin with me. Amen. Let it begin with David Rowland.